All right, uh, we're in First John. We're actually getting, uh, we have one more week in chapter four after this week, one week in chapter four, and then we're really kind of getting to those climactic passages in, in chapter five that really, that really probably another four weeks or so in First John, and then a few weeks in Second John, a few weeks in Third John, uh, <clears throat> and then probably Hebrews, I think, after that. Christian love, we've been dealing with it now. This is really kind of the third week in a row, although I would argue that this week's message, I didn't call this part three of, you know, this, this you know, four part on Christian love because really today's message is only a, a, a portion of it really dealing with that subject. Uh, we'll, we'll kind of get there in a second. But Christian love for the brothers is, is evidence, what we've seen, Evidence of genuine salvation. We looked at that the last two weeks. We'll look at that again next week. But it's not just Christian love. There's things like sound doctrine and faithfulness and more that we see throughout this letter that are really the, the, the bases for the eternal security, the assurance that we see in chapter 5 and verse 13. Now, you, you might remember, <clears throat> you might remember from chapter 2 and 19, and you, I mean, if, if you've forgotten it, I've only brought it up like a thousand times during you know this this series, just because I I want to I want to keep reminding you and keep my, in my mind because I I forget things too I forget things all the time I don't even remember what, what happened the other day yeah someone sent me a text and it was like an hour later I sent a text to the person and asked a question that he answered like an hour earlier in his text and. And it was like one hour later, I already forgot that the person answered the question, right? So I forget things. So I, I remind myself stuff. And I, I don't want to forget some of the context because the context of this, this letter really helps me understand what's really going on and how to really interpret what's happening. And so you're going to remember, hopefully, you're going to remember that there was that group of people that went out in chapter 2 and verse 19. And, and to me, that is a significant part of the context. There was a group of people who had left the church and claimed to have authority from God, which we see in the beginning of chapter 4. They don't trust in the work of Christ on the cross. They're not faithful to the local church and and to worship. That's what If they were faithful, they wouldn't have left, right? They don't deal with their sin in a God-honoring way. They don't have love for the brothers. They love the world and the things that are in the world. And so by the time you get to chapter 5, they should not have assurance of salvation. They're pretty much the opposite of, every, of everything that John lists as people who should have assurance of salvation. In chapter 4, we're seeing that genuine believers, they receive God's love, and then they go and they give it out. Today, John continues writing about love, but before he, he says something about love in verse 16, he writes about a sound confession of Jesus Christ, which really is intricately connected to biblical love. A sound confession of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 15. Let me, uh, I'm going to try to, we'll keep this up throughout most of the message, but we're really going to focus on verse, just verses 15 and 16 today. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in him. And so we've seen up to this point that love for the believer is rooted in God's love for us. We've seen that assurance of salvation is connected to Christian love. At least Christian love is part one of the, you might even say, prerequisites for assurance of salvation. But, but now John, once again, as he's done several times throughout this letter, returns to the importance of a sound confession, a sound understanding of Jesus Christ. Biblical love, true biblical love, is rooted in a confession of and a belief in the biblical Jesus. Now, what does it mean to confess that Jesus is the Son of God? Is this, are these just words? Because you have similar passages, right? If you confess with your mouth uh, the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised from him from the dead, you shall be saved, Romans 10, 9. 
something about confessing there that, that's, that's significant. <clears throat> I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And so now I've said the words, I've confessed, and so I know that I have God. I know that I'm saved. Is that, is that what it is? Is it, that, is it that magical formula of words where I speak these words in the proper order, or I, or I claim to believe in some version of Jesus, and now I abide in God and he abides in me? Is that what John is saying here? Do we really think as we read through this whole letter and we get to chapter 4 and verse 15, we really think that this is just about making a profession of faith? And if you think that, then you are, you're not paying attention to anything John's written. You're ignoring what he wrote in chapter 1 about dealing with sin. You're ignoring what he wrote in chapter 2 about Jesus being the, 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 the sacrifice that satisfies the wrath of God. You're ignoring all types of stuff about how a person lives about how a person loves biblically, about their faithfulness to the local church. You're ignoring all of it. You can't get to chapter 4, verse because you say, well, you know, this just says if we, if we confess Jesus as the Son of God, then, then you know, we're, we're, we're believe, we abide in God, and God abides in us, so we're saved. I just have to make a profession of faith. You're missing it all. You're missing the whole thing. John is talking about a sound understanding of Jesus Christ, and it's something that he's written about already in this letter a couple of times. For instance, in chapter 2 and verse 23, whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. We've already seen that. We see again in uh, chapter 4 and verse 2, by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But this is more than just saying that Jesus is the Son of God. Just about everyone within Christendom will make that claim. This is about having a sound understanding of who Jesus is. And not just understanding who Jesus is, but then actually taking up your cross and following him and living for him. If you don't have a biblical understanding of Jesus, you're creating a false God. One that does not exist in reality. Genuine believers... Genuine believers, they accept a biblical Jesus. They recognize that Jesus existed in eternity past. And that's an important phrase. Jesus existed in eternity. In the beginning was the Word. Jesus existed in eternity past. He is the creator and the sustainer of the universe. All things were made by him, and without him nothing was made that was made. Go over in John 1, 1 through 3, and Colossians 1, 15 through 17, which we're not going to turn there today. We're seeing that Jesus, that all things were made through him, and for him, and that he holds those things. We've talked about this many times. Jesus entered into human flesh. He lived a perfect, sinless life. He died on the cross to pay the penalty for the sins of the world, a penalty that we could never pay in order to reconcile us to God, in order to make us go from being enemies of God to being friends of God. That's a biblical Jesus. He was buried in a tomb. He rose again on the third day. He ascended into heaven to take his seat at the right hand of God. It's vitally important that we believe in the biblical Jesus. The problem is that not everyone does that. There have been all types of false views about Jesus throughout history, all types of historical heresies. Many of those historical heresies still exist today and, 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 and are believed in by cults. <clears throat> For instance, I'll give you at least three examples of people who claim to, at some level, or at least two of those three examples, are people who claim to confess that Jesus is the Son of God. All right, there's at least a couple examples of that. One of these examples rejects even that. The Watchtower Organization. The Watchtower Organization will knock on your door and tell you, if you ask them, they will tell you that Jesus is the Son of God. They'll say, they will confess, quote unquote, confess Jesus is the Son of God. Oh, so they must have God, and God must be in them. Now, if we're not looking at John, we're not looking at the whole context of what John's written, then we're going to come to a false conclusion like that. But let me tell you a few things about the Watchtower organization, which you know as the Jehovah's Witnesses, the false prophet 
Jehovah's Witnesses, they believe that Jesus was created by God the Father. They reject the deity of Christ, thus they believe in the historical heresy of Arianism. Right? They mistranslate passages like John 1.1. 1, 1. Uh, they will claim that Jesus was a God and miss the entire point that John was making in the first 18 verses that culminate in no man had seen God at any time, the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father. He has declared him. The whole point of the first 18 verses of John, the opening paragraph was that Jesus is divine, that he is God. They miss it. They miss it because they think there's, oh look, there's, there's no definite article here in Greek. Well, Greek doesn't have an indefinite article. And so they're claiming some false understanding. They're claiming Jesus is a God, an indefinite article that Greek doesn't even have. All right, so you have to look at the context of the argument, and it's clear that Jesus has the quality of Godhood, that he is God. It's clear in that passage. They miss that. They reject that. They say that Jesus, again, was a God. They claim that Jesus, and we talked about this just a few weeks ago, they claim that Jesus and Michael the archangel are the same person. And that was published in a 1995 issue of Watchtower. Uh, they say that he was the Lagos, then Michael, then Jesus the man, that he became the Christ when he was baptized, and eventually he became Michael the archangel again. And none of that is substantiated in Scripture in any way. And so, so if those people claim that Jesus is the Son of God, they're not making the same confession that we're making. They're not making that confession at all. It's not just a false view of Jesus that they have. It's a false view. They peddle a false gospel. So they don't even believe in salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, and the completed work of Christ on the cross alone. They, they believe in salvation. If you get down to it with them, they believe in salvation by faith plus works. That's what they believe in. And so they fail when it comes to confessing Jesus as the Son. How? They've created a completely different Jesus with a completely different gospel. They've completed a gospel where Jesus' work on the cross is not everything that you need for salvation, but that it's only part of the picture and that you need to work your way, you need to do the rest. So you, you place your faith in Jesus, he got you most of the way, now you've got to do the rest, that's their gospel. They have not confessed Jesus is the Son of God. That's a false gospel. That's a false understanding of Jesus. The Mormons are the next group uh, that fail when it comes to confessing Jesus is the Son. They believe, and you've heard some of this, not all this, but they believe that the Father God, they believe that Father God and Mother God conceived spirit children and that Christ was the very first one. Hmm. We find that in, in, in the scriptures somewhere, do we? Uh, they believe that Jesus and Lucifer are brothers, that Lucifer offered to become the savior of the world, but that he disagreed with parts of God's plan and was cast out. That's what they believe. Uh, they believe that God the Father had a sexual union with Mary, and that's how Jesus came into human flesh, through the Father having intercourse with Mary. They believe that Jesus was married, that after he uh, was resurrected, that he appeared to the North Americans and gave them some version of the gospel. They believe that Christ was a prototype to show the way by which men become gods through effort and obedience. That's what they believe. They believe that God was once less than he is. Did you hear that? So when you see Elder Jim or Elder Jack, or Elder whatever their names are, on the, you know, the guys that walk around, you know, they dress, dress a lot like how I'm dressed right now, except without the tie. Well, maybe they, they wear the tie, they still wear ties. They wear the name tag. So if you see the name tag, Elder so-and-so, then you know you're dealing with the Mormon, right? They don't typically wear a jacket, and sometimes they don't wear a tie, but they always wear the name tag. When I drove, when I drove up and I saw a couple of, couple of these so-called elders, you know what an elder is in the Bible? He's a pastor. The pastor, elder, bishop. We see that in 1 Peter 5, verses 1 through 4. We see it in Acts 20, verses 20, uh, 17 through 28. We see it really in 1, uh, 1 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 7. We see it in Titus uh, chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. Uh, we see it all over the place. But uh, for them, you know, elders, 
They're elders. And so they go out and they, they peddle this false gospel. And I drove up and I said, don't listen to them. They're false teachers. And, uh, you know, they looked all nice and kind. And the guy that was listening to him, I don't know if he was too happy with me, but I was trying to give him a warning. I was trying to be a friend. They believe that God was once less than he is. That he progressed to more greatness. Here's a quote from a one, one uh, president of the L, they call themselves the LDS, the Latter-day Saints Church. I, I, they're not saints, so I don't really like using that term. Lorenzo Snow said this. Listen to this, listen to this quote. As man now is... As man now is, our God once was. So our God used to be just like we are today. That's what they say. And the rest of the quote is, as now God is, so man may be. Do you think they confess that Jesus, they'll tell you Jesus is the Son of God. They'll tell you that. But they have not confessed Jesus is the Son. They have created a completely different God, let alone Jesus. Listen to what the damnable heretic Joseph Smith said. He said this, God himself who sits enthroned in yonder heavens is a man like unto one of yourselves. That is the great mystery, he writes. The great secret. I am going to tell you how God came to be God. We have imagined that God was God from all eternity. We have imagined it, he says. God himself, the Father of us all, dwelt on an earth the same as Jesus Christ himself did. Don't think these guys are the same as we are. It is a damnable cult. Damnable heresy. You want to follow something like that? You want to think that you're, you're the, oh, the, 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 the Jehovah's Witnesses are making a claim that, that Jesus is the Son of God, we must be the same as they are? No, we're not. The, the, those, those really friendly people that wear the name tags, you know, the Mormons, they don't like to be called Mormons anymore. You're not supposed to call them Mormons anymore. They're also politically correct now, I suppose, right? You can't call them Mormons anymore. Damnable heretics. They do not confess Jesus as the Son of God, not the way John did. They'll use the words, but they mean something entirely different. They reject what God says in his word. In fact, they'll tell you right out. They'll tell you right out that they reject the sole authority of, of the Bible. The Muslims are just as bad in their theology of Christ. They also deny the Trinity. They deny the existence of the Holy Spirit. They claim that Jesus was a Muslim and a prophet of Allah, the moon god. They say that the Bible is so corrupt that the true Jesus, listen to this, the true Jesus is nothing like the Bible claims. Now, how do these people, you, you know, you, you, you can't make these claims when you believe this type of stuff. They claim that the Christians worship three gods, the Father, the Mother, and the Son. That's their claim. That's how they understand the Bible. They claim that Jesus could not have been the Son of God. Well, that one's a little bit easier. That one's a little bit easier. It's easier to recognize how false they are. They claim that Jesus did not die for our sins, was not crucified, is not the Savior of the world. So, I mean, the cults, whether it's by outright confession or by twisting Jesus into something entirely different, they deny Jesus as the Son of God. Even though the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses will make that claim they're denying Jesus is the Son of God. The Pentecostals are another one that maybe they would make the claim that Jesus is the Son of God, but, but by means of all those extra-biblical prophecies that, stand, that fly in the face of Scripture, they create a God or a version of Jesus that's completely different than the one we would hold to, a, a version of a God that would be all about prosperity and health in this life only, or in this life primarily. The cults deny the Son of God Again, they either outright deny it like the Muslims do or they create a completely different Jesus like the Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, or, or many 
uh, Pentecostals. Some of them, again, may say that Jesus is the Son of God. They mean something entirely different, and they are not confessing the Son. And so we see the importance of confessing a true biblical Jesus. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in, in God. This is not just saying Jesus is the Son of God, no matter what you think of Jesus or who he is, by implication and by what John's already written throughout the letter, it's a biblical Jesus. A Jesus who has come in the flesh and died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins. A Jesus who is divine. And we see this confession of Jesus, the true biblical Jesus, as one basis for genuine salvation in the second part of the verse. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. This speaks of the presence of God. This speaks of a person who is genuinely saved. God remains in the genuine believer. He dwells in him. They're disciples of Jesus Christ. It's something we've seen throughout this letter. And so if you're genuinely saved, you confess the one biblical Jesus. Those who confess a false Jesus or an unbiblical Jesus or have created some other version of Jesus that's not in the Bible, they're not genuinely saved. So Jehovah's Witness comes up to me and he says, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm part of the people of God. I would have a few questions about that. Oh, which, which, which people of God are you according to your beliefs? Are you part of the 144,000? You know, or <laughs> whatever else. That's a whole other question for a whole, a whole discussion for another day. But I would say, uh, no. No, you're not, you're not part of the people of God because the Jesus you confess is a different Jesus. The Jesus of the mainline denominationals is a different Jesus. A Jesus who not only tolerates, but condones major life sin, like homosexuality, for instance. It's not sin. You don't need to repent of it. I think my daughter used the term, is it you who told me, um, oh, a lot of churches are LGBT friendly. I came, you know, a lot of churches today are LGBTQ friendly. Well, they've created a different Jesus. They've created a different God. So they have not confessed Jesus as the Son of God. They've twisted him into something different. Genuinely saved people confess the one true biblical Jesus genuine believers, we can have confidence in God's love. We have come to know, verse 16, we have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love. And the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. So genuine believers have come to know and have believed. Have come to know and have now, these are both, this is something, these are both something that have happened in the past with ongoing results. That is, we have come to know and we continue to know, we have believed and we continue to believe the love which God has for us. And we know a couple of passages that John has already talked about in here about the love of God. God uh, loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So, so how God loved us was, we, we, we just saw uh, weeks ago, uh, how God loved us was that he sent his son to die on the cross, to pay the penalty for our sins, to satisfy the wrath of God. That wrath that God has against us, against our sins. And that sacrifice paid the penalty for our sins. God loved us by... Uh, we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Just a few verses earlier, Jesus came to die in our place and to pay a penalty for our sins, which is the greatest display of love in all of human history. Another verse that we've looked at many times lately, God demonstrated his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so genuine believers have come to know and have believed, and we continue to know and believe, that's, that's, that's really, I mean, we're not going write it, to write it out that way in a translation, but that's really, that, that, that's really this, the, the tense is showing, it's showing action that took place in the past and is continuing, continuing to have results today. We have come to know 
and have believed the love which God has for us, love that was displayed on the cross. Genuine believers understand that God is love. And we saw this back in verse 8. It's repeated again here. And we're seeing the love of God in the sacrifice of his son, the, uh, the one who abides in love, abides in God, and God abides in him. Biblical love is rooted in a confession of Jesus Christ in these verses. It's rooted in a sound understanding of Jesus Christ. Love is connected to genuine faith. And so when you see this idea of we have come to know and to believe the love which God has for us, it's immediately following this confession of a biblical Jesus. We see these two important aspects of assurance, a sound doctrine of Jesus Christ and a genuine understanding of God's love, whereby we've received God's love, where God has displayed that love to us, and where we have now turned around and given it out to other people. It's a mark of those who are genuinely saved. And that biblical love and God's love is rooted in a biblical Jesus. Biblical love is rooted in a sound confession of Jesus Christ, which makes believers different than people who have left the church in chapter 2. Genuine Christians love the church. They understand they have come to know and believe the love which God has for them and thus display that. That's what we've seen up through verse 15. That's what we're going to see in verses 17 through the end of the chapter, that displaying of God's love. All of this stuff, these three, these three parts that we kind of went through last week, two weeks, next week, a week, all three of those sermons are rooted here in a sound confession of Jesus Christ. By the way, any love we've talked about any love that is not rooted in a sound confession of Jesus Christ is deficient. It's not enough. It's, it's insufficient in some way. And the world, again, has a completely deficient understanding of love, which most of the time it's about feelings. In the world, we've talked about this, and I think the world confuses love and lust. I think they confuse those two things. I think too many people in churches confuse those things as well. Confuse those things. For the world, love is primarily about the overwhelming emotions of the moment. A lot of times. That's how the world defines it most of the time. Emotions that, you know, I, it's, it's, it's often, it's not always young people, but it's often young people who fall prey to, to this error. And, uh, and, and they think in terms of their emotions. And they make decisions that will affect the rest of their lives on the basis of volatile emotion that's in their heart at the moment. Let's imagine if we, uh, in, in other words, You'll marry someone that you have strong, overwhelming feelings for at this moment in time, knowing, or maybe not knowing, that emotions like this are volatile. That sometimes you have really strong emotions where you feel, where you feel good about someone, and sometimes those emotions get, where you really can't stand a person, right? And then you have really strong, strong feelings again, and then you can't stand them again, and stuff like that. That happens. Does that ever happen? That happens. I mean, hopefully you can't stand Hopefully you're more on the higher side of that. Of that. But, 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 but emotions are volatile. Let's imagine we did that about everything. Let's imagine that every single time I feel a strong emotion about something, I act. Would that be a, would that be a sound way of living? Every time I saw a car that I was like, oh, man, I love that car. i like, you know what? I'm going to go buy it. I'm going to go buy it. I really like a Dodge Challenger. I do. I like it. I like a Dodge Challenger. My wife likes a Subaru. She says, oh, I'm not, I have no interest in it. Look at that. Look at that. That's a hot car. Look at that Dodge Challenger. I could just imagine revving it up and, you know what I mean? She's like, who needs that? You know what's a good car? It's a Subaru. Just like, oh man. We are not understanding things the same way. We are not on the same page. Imagine I went out, I don't know what a Dodge Challenger costs. I think it's probably at least 50 or 60,000. Anyone have any idea? 
I have an emotion where I really like that Dodge Challenger and I go out and I buy it. I'll deal with the repercussions later. I get really upset at work. I get really annoyed and I quit. I'll deal with the repercussions later. And we could just go from one thing to the next thing to the next thing. Why, we, we don't do that in life. I mean, ho hopefully you don't. If you do that, come talk to me. We'll set up some counseling. Okay, well, we'll let, let me help you. I'll help you. We don't do that when it comes. But for, for, for some reason, society in general does that when it comes to marriage. And it's because of a false understanding of love. A deficient understanding of love. Love in the Bible, again, is sacrifice. But that sacrifice cannot be an extension of God's love if it's not based on Jesus Christ. And any sound version of love must be based on the biblical Jesus. And so all these instances where I'm thinking about how the decisions that I need to make and, and, and how I'm carrying out love and what love is and, 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 and things like maybe even who I'm going to marry or, or, or whatever, all has to be based and rooted in a sound understanding of Jesus Christ and what he wants. What he did. So, so whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, this is not just uh, this is not just some some doctrinal thing. It is doctrinal, but it's doctrinal and it's practical. So I'm confessing this. I'm believing this. I'm investing in this, and now I'm living my life according to it. The problem is, too many people will confess that Jesus is the Son of God, but then they go and live in a in a way that's completely opposite of that. Does that ever happen? That happens. And when people live in a way that discredits that profession, then what you're probably showing is that that, that, con that confession of Jesus Christ isn't real. God is the one who defines what love is, and he defines it through his son. He he, he displays it through his son. God loved, God suffered so that we would benefit. The cross was a terrible time of agony for God, and yet it's the most glorious moment in all of human history for us. That's a little bit of a display of what, what God's love is. He loved in a way that was costly for him, but beneficial to us. And whatever bad thing might happen, even in the here and now, needs to be weighed against God's love for us in eternity. Even death, even death, which might seem like a bad thing uh, for us now, uh, is a glorious thing for those who love God. For me to live, for to me to live is Christ, but to die is gain, the Apostle Paul writes. And so in this passage, uh, we see really one, we see a way in which, in the greater paragraph, we see two characteristics that define uh, or, or that are the basis of eternal security, that are the basis of assurance. This is how I know I'm genuinely saved. Do I have a biblical love for the brothers? Do I have a sound confession of Jesus Christ? Really, that second part is what we focused on today the biblical Jesus, that love, everything that's around these verses is rooted in a sound confession, a sound doctrine, and really a sound practice of Jesus. Both of those characteristics in the greater paragraph, uh, when coupled with the rest of what John writes, is evidence of genuine salvation so that by the time you get to chapter 5 and verse 13, these things have I written unto you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you might know that you have everlasting life. By the time you get there, then you can know that you're saved and you can have assurance of salvation on the basis of all this stuff that John writes. But again, in this paragraph, probably beginning around verse 7 and going right through verse 21, right through the, the end of the chapter, really, uh, in this paragraph, we see the importance of biblical love. Genuine love is rooted in the true knowledge of biblical Jesus Christ. And those who understand the biblical Jesus who have placed their faith in him, they have received God's love and they can therefore display it to those in the world. We can know, based on chapter 5 and verse 13, we can know for sure that we have everlasting life. 
we can know that we're genuinely saved when we place our faith in the biblical Jesus, having received God's love and displaying it to the church. I'd like to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes for a brief moment of invitation. Just you, me, and God, no one looking around will we'll respect everyone's privacy. But you're here today and you're not sure you're saved. You're not sure you're going to heaven when you die. Would you just raise your hand up for me? I'd like to pray for you privately. I'm not sure I'm, I'm, not sure I'm going to heaven. If I die today, I'm not sure I'm going to heaven. Just raise your hand up for me enough for me to see it so I could pray for you privately. You're in this room and you know you're confident of your salvation, but uh, God, has, God has convicted you about some things in your life. And you want to make a commitment to him today. You want to maybe, maybe recommit your life to him, maybe, conf- maybe, maybe repent of sin or whatever it is. I don't know what it is, but God, is, God has convicted you today and you want to make a decision for him. Would you just raise your hand up for me? I'd like to pray for you privately. I see that hand. <coughs> I see that hand. God is convicting me about something in my life today. And I, I want to... I want to make a commitment about that. Heavenly Father, we come before you and praise you and thank you for this time that we have. We thank you that you've given us a letter like this that we can look at and not just look at surface level words, but really get underneath and see what you're actually saying by looking at the greater context of of these letters. We thank you that you've given us these so that we can know you closer to you. There are almost assuredly unsaved people in this room. And for whatever reason, uh, I, don't, I don't see any hands, but you, you, know, you know who they are. And I hearts. Convict them afresh Continue to convict them until they turn and repent and place their faith in you and be saved. I pray for these to whom you've convicted and maybe others who didn't raise their hands. And, and I just pray that, again, that you would encourage those who need encouragement, that you would convict those who need con- conviction, that you would send the conviction when it's needed send the strength through your Holy Spirit to have the victory when Satan comes to sift them like wheat. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 635. 635. If you take your hymnals and turn to 635.